Hi everyone, Laszlo here. Before we get started with today's episode, I wanted to quickly mention that along with my good friends at avid.fm, I'm once again pleased to present a new set of courses that introduces the history of Chinese philosophy. I'll be releasing a full announcement about this online audio course later on. But if you want to go check it out, I invite you to go to avid.fm slash Laszlo. I'll have a link to this at the show notes accompanying this episode. My thanks to all of you, and I hope you'll enjoy these courses, as well as other great online audio courses available at avid.fm. That's A-V-I-D dot F-M. And now, on to the episode on Part 3 of the Taiping Rebellion. Welcome back, everybody, all over this wonderful world of ours. Laszlo Montgomery here with Part 3 in our informative overview of the Taiping Rebellion, one of the most tumultuous and consequential events in modern Chinese history. We're still in the eventful year of 1853, after a string of amazing victories taking town after city along the Yangtze River. The rebels made it to eastern Jiangsu province, and on March 19th, they captured and occupied the city of Nanjing, and in between Nanjing and Shanghai. There were some rather rich pickings in their gun sites, Zhenjiang, Yangzhou, Taizhou, Changzhou, Wuxi, Suzhou, and Nantong. All of these cities will soon get violently caught up in the rebellion for the next decade. But as we left off last episode, after kicking back for a couple months following the taking of Nanjing, the heavenly king of the Taiping Heavenly Kingdom, Hong Xiuquan, squandered their advantage. And from the moment he declared his temporal authority till now, the heavenly kingdom had grown into a massive enterprise that would grow to millions of followers. The movement started with the Hakkas, the Miao, the Zhuang, and other society rejects. Now, a whole new pool of recruits was joining up in this region of China that once comprised the ancient state of Wu. The new recruits were thoroughly indoctrinated, trained, they went through an exhausting boot camp, and were turned into a very effective fighting force, described by some accounts as fearless and fanatical. Now the dynasty was taking them much more seriously than before, and one of the first things they did was to box the Taipings in Nanjing from the north and from the south. I mentioned Xiang Rong and Xi Shan last episode, who commanded that effort. So I wanted to first begin by looking at the two campaigns that kicked off the Taiping army's attempt to take the north and expand their political and social will on that part of the country. Guangdong, Guangxi, Hunan, Hubei, Jiangsu, Jiangxi, these were the provinces most affected by the fighting and the unrest. All sites were set on the north and west. The mastermind for the summer offensive that would go down in the history of the times as the northern and western expeditions was Yang Xiuqing, the eastern king. Yang surely saw how his boss, Hong Xiuquan, had withdrawn from governing and was seeming to deteriorate right before his eyes. He was in no position to lead. And in the coming few years, Yang Xiuqing will aggressively assert his authority more boldly. And the consequences of that we'll get to a bit later in the episode. The Northern Expedition's primary objective was to topple the Manchus and take Beijing, thereby putting an end to the Qing Dynasty. May 8th, 1853, this ill-fated expedition kicked off. Participating in this campaign were about 70,000 vets from the Guangxi days, the best the Taiping army had. They were supplemented with a fair supply of new recruits, and together they were a very large and dangerous force. They had to pass through a lot of territory to get to their destination, and as they marched north, they left a trail of suffering, especially to any towns or village people who resisted them. By June of that year, they had already made it to the Yellow River. The land was still trying to recover from the horrific floods of 1851 to 55. It took till the 1870s before the last of that natural disaster was felt. This was one of those floods that came about when the Yellow River changed its course, emptying out into the Bohai Sea instead of the Yellow Sea, and here they committed the first of two major blunders. 
just north of the city of Zhengzhou, in the present-day city of Qinyang, which back in the Qing was called Huaiqing. There they wasted two full months laying siege to this city. Well, two months wasted trying to blow this house down. The siege of Huaiqing proved to be a costly failure. They lost a lot of fighting men in the process. Besides all the resources and lives wasted on the siege, they were now two months closer to winter. All my wonderful and good-looking listeners up in Beijing and northern Hebei province know it gets cold in the winter around those parts. Taiping rebels, being southerners and all, had no idea yet. As summer changed to autumn, they marched north through Shanxi and Hebei, then called Zhili province. And to get to Beijing... It was a long march north through the heartland of that province. It was well into October by the time they got to within a hundred miles of Beijing, and here's where they committed their second major blunder. Rather than just keep going and take Beijing, they opted instead to first march to the next city over to the east of the capital, that being Tianjin. Now, from what I found in my research, Beijing, at that moment in time, was theirs for the taking. So effective were the Taiping forces, the Manchu Qing rulers had this feeling of inevitability as far as how things would turn out in the event of the Taiping army marching on the capital. They had secreted out the contents of the imperial treasury as well as anything of value that they didn't want the Taipings to capture. Beijing was defended, of course, but not a lot of faith was placed in those forces. A little more time was needed to get more soldiers in place in the capital. So rather than keep heading straight north to the Qing capital when the whole upper crust was shaking in their boots, the Taipings veered east to go knock off Tianjin. And as the Taiping army continued their march of folly, more reinforcements were put in place in Bay and precious time was acquired to prepare for the onslaught when it came. But it was already getting to be early November. It starts to get pretty cold at night. And these soldiers <laughs> didn't pack their winter coats. But now, on October 30th, still in that fateful year of 1853, the Taiping army closed in on the city of Tianjin. One of the Manchu's secret weapons was this very capable Mongol general named Sangha Rinchen. He handed the Northern Expeditionary Forces a costly defeat just to the south of Tianjin. If you stood on the city walls, you could have watched it all play out. Between their losses at the siege of Huaiqing and now in Tianjin, things were looking terribly desperate for the Taiping Northern Expedition's prospects. And as I said, they indeed found themselves wholly unprepared for all the challenges a Northern Hebei winter had to offer. And after enough Qing reinforcements were in place, they went on the attack against an utterly degraded Taiping army. Things went from bad to worse, and Taiping reinforcements never showed up. By February of 1854, whoever among the Taiping army that was still standing, they beat a retreat back south. This northern campaign was a 22-month unmitigated disaster. Even the Taiping commander, Li Kaifeng, was captured and duly executed. Throughout this northern campaign, the Taipings had a friend and ally in the Nian rebels, fighting their own uprising against the Qing rulers, calling for killing the rich and aiding the poor. This relationship between the Nian and Taiping rebels and their failure to effectively coordinate their operations is always pointed to as a sizable historic missed opportunity. There indeed was some cooperation between the two, but in the end, it wasn't enough to achieve their mutual objectives. The Western campaign, though nowhere nearly as disastrous, fared little better. Eleven days after the Northern campaign departed, another Taiping army started marching west. Their opponent would be the same Hunan army general who inflicted so much pain on them during their march through Hunan in earlier days. And this was Jiang Zhongyuan. The Western campaign forces had a few smashing successes as they made their way towards Sichuan, Gansu, and Shanxi. In Anhui, 
Jiangxi, and Hunan, they scored major victories, leaving a trail of destruction wherever they marched. In Anhui, they even defeated forces that were personally led by Jiang Zhongyuan, who was injured in the fight. After his troops were beaten soundly, rather than fall into Taiping hands, Jiang Zhongyuan committed suicide. Even forces led by Zheng Guofan tasted defeat at the hands of the Taiping army. So angry and disappointed at the outcome of one battle was Zheng Guofan, even he attempted suicide. Despite all their setbacks, missed opportunities, and defeats, the Taiping Rebellion was still a wildfire that was not even close to being contained. But by the time 1856 rolled around, this Western campaign started to stall, and suddenly, urgent matters back in the heavenly capital of Tianjin cut the whole thing short, and after the call came out from Hongxiu Chen, they raced back to their heavenly capital. I don't know how many of you are familiar with Howard Hughes. He was one of the richest men in the world in his day, but following a plane crash in 1946, he became a famous recluse until the day he died in 1976. He ran his whole business empire from a hotel room. That was what had become of Hong Xiu Chen. He became a recluse, and like Howard Hughes, he had this overpowering mental disorder regarding hygiene and sanitation and he micromanaged everything through a network of spies and messengers who carried all his orders or letters to their intended destinations. While the Taiping forces were still out fighting in the West, Tsung Guofan was confident for the first time that his Hunan army was ready for battle. And not just the army, his navy as well. So in late spring of 1854, Tsung Guofan took the fight to the Taiping army in Hunan, where, operating on his home turf, he handed the Taipings two major defeats, first at Xiangtan, and a month later at Yuezhou. Then in October 1854, Wuhan was taken back from the rebels. But the Taipings rallied in Zhejiang and Jiangxi province, and their navy was able to take advantage of Tsung Guofan's Hunan navy's mistake of allowing their fleet to get bottled up in Lake Poyang, and then the Taipings had a rally. First of all, they finally broke that north-south siege that the Qing had been able to enforce since Hong's army had taken Nanjing. But into 1855 and 56, as I said, things were getting ugly at the top layer of leadership in the Hongwu Emperor's former palace, now in Hong Xiaotran's heavenly capital, battles were raging up and down the Yangtze between the rebels and those trying to wipe them out. Stories about velocity of the killing and how one could walk from town to town and see evidence of the worst slaughter. And not just on land. The river, as wide as it was, was sometimes filled with corpses rotting away. The killing wasn't only happening in these big battles and sieges. It was going on in every village and town in this massive kill zone. And keep in mind, besides all the battle casualties, plague and famine by now was rife. Of the 20 million or so who died in this conflict, those two historic scourges on humankind, starvation and disease, equaled the killing going on everywhere, on the battlefields and in the villages. By 1855, there were six areas of popular unrest in the empire. And I'm not counting the foreign powers who were becoming more and more insistent to deal with this renegotiation of the Treaty of Nanjing thing. The Manchu Qing government was in a terrible bind, juggling these social and political upheavals. Thankfully for them, I guess you could say, all was not well at the tip-top of the Taiping hierarchy. There's evidence that suggests Hong himself was not entirely well. No one knows for sure if he suffered from any maladies that might have affected his judgment. I told you that Yang Xiaoqing was already calling most of the shots. And as we entered the year 1856, Yang Xiaoqing was making all kinds of moves to kick Hong Xiaotren upstairs, so to speak, and take over as the political and spiritual leader of the kingdom. More and more, he saw Hong Xiaotren to be the weak link in the heavenly kingdom. Meanwhile, the intrigue going on inside the palace was raging at a full boil. 
Yang continued to throw his weight around and used his secret police to get his way and stifle any dissent. Ever since the beginning, this rivalry between Yang and Hong had played out quietly in the background. This eastern king had played his one card very well. He communicated with God, and he could always rely on that endorsement from the Heavenly Father to promote his agenda. And Hong allowed it, much to his political detriment. So, that it finally all came down to this, the Tianjing incident, you can say it was inevitable. But from the very beginning, Hong had done little to keep Yang in check. He didn't make fast work of him in Thistle Mountain when he had the chance. And as Yang grew in importance and criticality and the overall running of the Taiping Heavenly Kingdom, especially the military, it was really too late for Hong to do anything about it. At a time when he should have been leading, when his great moment had come, he should have rose to the occasion. But instead, he became intoxicated by the perks of power and political privilege. And ever since the establishment of the Taiping Heavenly Kingdom, the rules demanded by the leaders of all their faithful to live their lives in a certain way, abstain from sex, segregating men and women, the frugality and communal living. Well, Hong and the entire upper echelon of the movement believed those rules didn't apply to them and hypocritically did as they pleased. The size of Hong Xiuquan's harem was legendary. By 1855, they finally loosened up on the prohibition on the mixing of the sexes. But Hong and his family, and all the top layer of leadership, they were not bound by any of these restrictions. And the stories of the kinds of activities that went on for the personal pleasure of the Heavenly King are debaucherous indeed. In this Tianjing incident, which lasted from September to October 1856, what transpired has been compared to Hitler's Night of Long Knives of June-July 1934. This is where Hong Xiaotren shakes himself loose from his stupor and makes a move to reassert his position at the top. At this point in Taiping history, of the five original kings, two had already been killed, leaving three plus one prince, Qin Gang. In 1856, when the actual events dramatically played out, besides the eastern king, Yang Xiaoqing, who was having this showdown with Hong, there were Wei Changhui and Shi Da Kai, the northern and wing kings. The eastern king had been throwing his weight around a lot lately and intimidated anyone who posed any kind of challenge. And this extended to Hong and the other kings. Yang had become untouchable and was running a mini reign of terror within the Taiping leadership. During the Battle of Jiangnan in June 1856, as I said, the Taiping army, led by Qin Gang, was finally able to break the north-south siege that the Qing military had been able to hold in place for three years. And as I mentioned, the Qing general, Xiang Rong, died from either his wounds received in battle or from suicide. And after this victory, Yang Xiaoqing figured now was going to be the best time to seize the top position in the movement. Once again, utilizing the unbeatable excuse of receiving these instructions directly from God, Yang made his move on Hong Xiaochen. He openly challenged him, insisting to put himself and his family on the same political and spiritual level as Hong Xiaochen, and to make sure there was no resistance from the other three, Shi Da Kai, Wei Changhui, and Qin Er Gang. He dispatched them to the provinces and got them out of the capital where they wouldn't be able to challenge him in this little coup d'etat. There was no love lost between Yang and his fellow leaders. Yang Xiaoqing had abused his power to put his fellow kings in their place to the extent that they had come to despise him. Hong Xiaoquan saw through Yang's orders at once and knew by getting these rivals out of town, his eastern king was making his power move. Hong sent word out to Shi, Wei, and Qin, and told them to hurry back to the capital, Tianjin. Qin Ergang arrived first, followed by Wei Changhui. Shi Da Kai was still fighting in Hubei and hadn't arrived yet. Hong met with Wei and Qin, and together they plotted their takedown of Yang Xiaoqing. And on September 2nd, 
1856, troops led by Qin and Wei seized Yang Xiuqing and killed him right there in the palace. And then they went after his followers and family too. And with the heavenly king, Hong Xiuquan, weary of Yang's loyal troops storming the palace for retribution, he worked things out with Qin and Wei to create a ruse to lure Yang's troops to the palace. They had been invited to witness the execution of these two, and Yang Xiuqing's army fell for this, hook, line, and sinker. And those who showed up to see Wei and Qin punished ended up getting killed themselves. And whoever of Yang Xiuqing's followers who remained, they were hunted down and all put to the sword. But it wasn't over yet. There was still more drama to come. By the time Shi Dakai arrived back in Tianjin and got a load of what had gone down over the past month or so, he predictably got all bent out of shape about the excessive violence, and he blamed Wei Changhui for all the excessive bloodletting. So the northern king, Wei, knew he now had an angry Shi Dakai to contend with, and he began to plot Shi's downfall. Shi Dakai got wind of the plot that Wei was hatching to have him arrested and charged with treason. So he knew he was about to get whacked. To avoid this unpleasantness, Shi Dakai departed Tianjin just as soon as he arrived, and his family, who was left behind in the capital, were decimated. As soon as Shi Dakai got wind of this, he demanded Wei and Qin be executed for their crimes. So Wei Changhui arranged for Qin Gang and his forces to defend against Shi Dakai, who was now marching on the heavenly capital. And while Qin prepared to take on Shi Dakai, Wei Changhui attempted to neutralize Hong Xiuquan and prevent him from doing anything. But Hong found out what they were up to and arranged for his guards to make fast work of Wei Changhui, which they did. And as soon as Qin Gang returned to the capital... He, too, was dealt with decisively. So everyone was now dead and gone, leaving only 26-year-old Shi Dakai as the sole remaining king. There were once five, plus Qin Gang. Now there was only one. And this event became known as the Tianjin Incident. Hong Xiuquan, in his capacity as the Heavenly King, thereupon made Shi Dakai the leader of all Taiping military forces and loaded him up with power and authority. But Shi, by this time, had had enough of Hong Xiuquan, and whatever faith he still had evaporated in the wake of this political trauma suffered by the movement. His family had just been murdered in cold blood, and the spirit of 1849 seemed like a million years ago. Although one could be safe in saying in 1856 that it was all over for the Taiping rebels, there were still eight long and agonizing years to go yet. As I keep saying, and you're probably tired of hearing it, the government in Beijing had multiple three-alarm fires going on all over the country, and the Taiping Rebellion was just one of five major rebellions and disturbances happening in the year of 1856 which now included the Hakka Bunti clan wars going on in southernmost China, where the Pearl River empties into the South China Sea. Ever since the end of the Great Clarence, caused by the Xunzhi and Kangxi emperors' ban on living along the coastline, from Zhejiang all the way to western Guangdong, well, when it was all over and the government said, you can now move back and populate these coastal cities and towns, well, that's when the Hakka people flooded into the area and got settled in those depopulated lands. And the local people there, the Bunti, well, I go through this in more detail in my History of the Hakka People episode. Let's just say these two mix like oil and vinegar, and the Qing military always had to maintain a presence in the area to make sure these two rivals didn't annihilate each other. The Hatfields and McCoys were all lovey-dovey compared to the Bunti and Hakka people. With the Taiping Rebellion heating up to 10,000 degrees Kelvin like it was, the Qing military could no longer act as the enforcer down in southern Guangdong. They couldn't spare the army they kept there, and once they were gone, especially after the start of the Second Opium War in 1857, 
these two groups went at it like never before. And by the time it ended in 1868, half a million to a million people died. And no small number of Hakka people, rather than deal with the aftermath of this bunti Hakka conflict, hit the road and made their way to destinations all over the world, but primarily in and around Southeast Asia. Yeah, the Qing Empire ruling in Beijing, they were encumbered by a multitude of events going on that tied their hands and allowed the chaos and bloodletting to reach levels no one could have imagined. And this coup, or purge, was over, and all who were left standing among the original core leadership was Hong Xiaoquan and Shi Dakai. Hong's brothers, Ren Fa and Ren Da, were declared kings, and Shi Dakai had refused the offer from Hong to be named the Righteous King. He knew Hong's two brothers were not so much evil as they were incompetent. And with these two siblings of Hong, wise to Shi Dakai's feelings toward them, they schemed to have him rubbed out. It seemed that there were no secrets kept because Shir got wind of what was being planned and laid low in the smoldering aftermath of the purge until the following year. And then in the summer of 1857, he departed Tianjin with his army of 100,000 men to carry on the fight out west. And with Shir Dakai gone, there was no one left in the heavenly capital to push back against Hong Xiaotren's increasingly erratic and irrational behavior. His paranoia seemed to know no limits. He surrounded himself with yes-men, all Hakka, of course, and mostly from his family. The Taiping Palace was stuffed with family members, attendants, hangers-on, concubines and their attendants, and in the middle of everything was Hong Xiaoquan micromanaging all affairs and seemingly more concerned with matters of sanitation, hygiene, and self-preservation. And besides all this, he still had an entire religion to manage, of which he was one of the central spiritual figures, you know, being the son of God and all, still rewriting the scriptures, deleting passages from the good book, and editing other parts. There was another alleged sibling of Hong Xiaochen, who I wanted to mention as we close things out here. He had a sister named Hong Xianjiao, who, well, there's not much written about her in English anyway, but she seemed to be quite an amazing figure from this conflict. According to one Chinese source, she was adopted by Yang Xiaoqing's family and was referred to as Yang Xianjiao, and that she was later proclaimed a daughter of Hong Xiaochen. Her life was a series of unverified legends. One source said she was married to Wei Changhui. Another said Xiao Chao Gui. There wasn't much written about her except that she was one of the early Hakkas who joined the movement and was a skilled martial artist and commanded an army of Hakka women soldiers who participated valiantly in this Taiping conflict. She's pointed to as one of the shining examples of how women were equals in this Taiping movement. Anyway, I just wanted to mention her. She seemed to have perished in the conflicts of uh, 1856 because that was the last I heard of her. Well, I plan to get into the other big thing that really caused a lot of problems for the government, namely the events leading up to, during, and after the Second Opium War and the subsequent treaties. But rather than get into that now, let's save that for next time in Part 4. We'll take a look at all that, and once the ink starts drying on the unequal treaty that ended the Second Opium War, that's when the foreigners jump into the pool, and we can all enjoy the likes of Frederick Townsend Ward, Charles, Chinese Gordon, the ever-victorious army, and others as well. And so, my fine friends, I'm going to leave you in peace for now, and it's truly my greatest hope that you'll mark it in your calendars to come back next time for another Episodio Emocionante of the China History Podcast.